All right, now James chapter number three. Uh, it's a great chapter, and the majority of this chapter is talking about your tongue and, and the things that you say and the things that you speak. And we're going to look down here. Look at verse number five. Um, because right, well, right before verse number five, it, it's likening, you know, it's saying there's these great ships, there's these great boats, right, that travel on the sea, but the helm is real small. You know, they've got this rudder that determines which way they turn, which direction they are. And there are these massive boats, but the actual component that determines which way they go is a real small piece of the boat. It's a real small piece of equipment. And now they're likening that to the tongue. It says in verse 5, even so, in this like manner as the ships, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And again, this is, this is something we're going to be, my sermon has to deal with our communication, with our talking. And... Um, it's explaining here that our tongues, they're small members. It's a very small piece of your body, but it, it can do great damage. And that's why it says, behold, um, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So you think about the big forest fires that we have, you know, especially up here in the Prescott area. There's these massive forest fires. And oftentimes they start with just one person's campfire or even a cigarette or like the smallest spark, just a, the smallest thing can ignite these fires that just grow until they get out of control and are just devastating and very destructive forces. And um, that's what it's explaining here is that you might think that your tongue is just one little thing, but, but the words that come out of your mouth can actually cause a great matter, a, a lot of destruction. You could do some major harm and some damage. Now you could also do some good with your tongue, but, but here we're focusing on the damage that could be created just by your tongue, just by one small portion, piece of your body. Verse number six says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Think about that. It's a world of sin. Your tongue can get you into so much sin. We need to make sure that we could tame our tongue. That's what the Bible says. Um, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. This is not something to take lightly. This is something that you need to take seriously. When you look at the language that's used, it's saying, look, there's animals, all the beasts of the field. Yeah, they've all been tamed. Mankind is able to tame those, but your tongue, they said no man can tame. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Very, very strong admonishment, admonishment here about our tongues. Verse number nine says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. You know, his blessings and cursings both are capable of coming out of our mouths. Verse number 10 out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine fig? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom." All of this is just, is just introduction to the main topic of the sermon, but I wanted to get that foundation of this great admonition in the book of James about how much damage our tongues can do and how much we need to be aware of what we speak. The title of my sermon this morning is Gossiping Busybodies. This is specifically the type of speech that I'm going to be preaching against today. It's something that, that prevails in our society. It's something that, that people are so caught up in this, in this Hollywood sensation, this, this, you know, want of following other people and just talking and gossiping, oh, all this stuff that's going around and, and so-and-so is dating this person and just all this talking about these celebrities and it's just a bunch of gossip and, um, and Christians ought not to be participating in this and that's just, that's just the, um, the, on the surface, we're going to get this and dig into this a little deeper. Turn if you would to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Just a little bit back in your Bible, 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 3. The first thing we're going to deal with is busybodies. In 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 3, what the Bible calls a busybody. 
Look at verse number 10 of 2 Thessalonians. It's right before 1 Timothy. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. In verse number 10, the Bible reads, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So his first example we see of a busybody. This is someone, he says, people who aren't working at all, but they're a busybody. Well, why are they busy if they're not working? Well, because they're busy in other men's matters. They're busy going about and, and talking about and getting involved in other people's business instead of just doing their own business and doing their own work. That's why he says in verse 12, with, with quietness, they should work. They need to work and eat their own bread. Don't be going about getting involved in everybody else's business. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Hey, worry about yourself. Worry about your own work. Do your own things. And, and with quietness, eat your own bread. And this is so serious. The Bible says in verse 14, it says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, someone who decides, nope, I'm not going to work. I'm just going to be a busybody. I'm just going to keep on getting involved in other people's business instead of minding my own business and working for myself and supporting myself and my family. He says, Note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. This is something that needs to be done today because these people, it's, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame to be a busybody, to be involved in other people's business and not just worrying about and focusing on your own business. You've got enough work to do for yourself. You don't need to be getting involved in everyone else's business. Keep your nose out of it. It's being, being a busybody, busybody saying, don't even company with them. Don't go out to eat with that person. They need to be ashamed. They need to be separated so that they can understand that we're not going to put up with, with you just getting involved in everyone else's business. You need to work it for yourself. And, um, and you know, this is something that happens typically when people get idle is the biggest problem. That's why he says, look, you need to do your own work. That's why he says working not at all, they become, they are busybodies. Because if you don't have your own work to do, what else are you going to do? You're going to start getting your nose and business and other people's business and other people's work. No, work for yourself. Get, keep yourself busy doing the work that you need to do. Hey, I'll tell you what, I don't have much of a problem getting involved in other people's business because I've got plenty of my own work to deal with. I don't, you know, I don't mind helping people when they need help, but there is so much going. There are not enough hours in the day to get the amount of work that I need to get done. Look, if you have a problem getting involved with other people's stuff, then get yourself busy. If you don't have that much work at home, you know, maybe, um, maybe at your job, they cut your hours back, you don't have that much work, hey, get a second job. Maybe, um, you know, for the w women, you, know, you don't have as much work at home, you don't have children, whatever, maybe they're grown or maybe you don't have any children yet, and, and you're saying, well, I don't have that much work to do. Get a hobby. Read the Bible. Dude, there's, there's lots of things to keep yourself busy with. But what you don't want to do is allow yourself to get idle because when you get idle, that's when you start. You have to come up with something to do. And, and one of the easiest things, and this affects women a lot more than it does men. And we're going to see that a little bit later because there's some special admonishment for women. And um, it's just a weakness that women have. You know, men and women are built differently. It's, just, it has a, it's a natural tendency for women to, to get involved with other people's business and to just kind of tend to gossip and talk about things. So, so women, you know, keep this in mind. This is serious. I mean, the Bible's saying, look, if you're a busybody, people shouldn't even be keeping company with you. And it's not just women. I mean, in this specific verse, it's talking about men. Because you say he, this is the masculine form. Anybody can be guilty of doing this. And this is saying, um, you know, working not at all, but our busybody. It says, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Now, again, I believe this applies to men and women, but specifically in this verse, this is talking about a man. And... Um, you know, as men, we need to make sure we're working hard and not just getting involved in everyone else's business. Same thing for the ladies. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. You're, you're in um, 2 Thessalonians. 1 Timothy is the next book. We're going to turn to chapter number 5. Verse number 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 5 reads, 
But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith, and withal they learn to be idle. Again, there it is, being idle. People who aren't working. They learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So we see here, again, the same, the same common problem is that they're idle. And this one is directed more towards the ladies, as we was talking about younger widows. People who, you know, they're younger and their, their husband has died, they passed on. Um, so because of this now, they've got a lot of free time on their hands and they end up wandering about from house to house, get involved in other people's business, finding out what's going on, what's the latest news, what's the gossip, what is there new to talk about. And um, it says not only either, but tattlers also. What's a tattler? It's someone who's telling on someone else, right? So you, these ladies are walking about from house to house, so they're hearing all the news from different people and then they're going around to the other person's house. Oh yeah, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh yeah, did you hear this about so and so? And it's and it's not you know it's one thing to to share good news about people, right? It's one thing to say, hey, with us, you know, the Romeros, they're our friends. They're starting a church. They're leaving tomorrow. They're gonna have you know, it's a great thing to talk about. It's it's something nice. But this is talking about people where you know if I were to find something just just negative to say about them, that there's no reason to be said at all. Like oh well, did you did you know that so and so is you know involved in whatever kind of sin or whatever whatever it is that people want to talk about and get involved in or can you believe they let their kid do this it's like shut up don't worry about their kids you worry about your own kids or worry about your own business don't get so idle that you need to be so much involved in everybody else's business worry about your own business and it says but tattlers also in busybodies speaking things which they ought not so according to the verse there's a lot of things that you could be speaking that you ought not and we need to be careful about this because we saw in James chapter 3, hey, the tongue is a world of iniquity. The tongue is very easy to get you into sin. There's so many ways you can sin with your tongue. And this is one of the ways you can do it is by being a tattler or a busybody and speaking things that you ought not. And this is the solution to that. This is for the younger widows. Verse number 14 says, I will therefore, so because of this, because this happens, because they get idle, because they become busybodies and tattlers and go about and do this stuff, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. So why is he saying this? Why should women marry and bear children and guide the house? Because it's going to keep them busy. That will keep them from being idle. When you get married, all of a sudden, now you have a job to do. You have to take care of your husband. You have to take care of the household. You have a lot of, you got a lot more work to take care of. And when you have children, even more work to be taken care of. You have to watch them, teach them, train them, do all this stuff, right? Um, it's going to keep you busy. And this is the role that God has laid, laid out for the younger women. This is, this is God's will. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4. Just a little bit further in your Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 4. We're going to look at verse number 12 of 1 Peter chapter 4. The Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. So what he's saying here in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, he's saying first, you know, don't think it's a strange thing when the fiery trial comes. When you get tried, when you go through persecutions, and you're going through these difficult times, he's like, don't think it's a weird thing. We told you about this. He says, rather rejoice, you know, when the enemy comes and attacks you. But he's saying... You know, he says, if you be reproach, reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. You know, should be happy if the reason why persecution is coming is because you're living a godly life, because you're living as an example to Christians, because this, you know, you're doing what's right. Hey, rejoice and be happy. But he, what he's saying is, 
if it's for other reasons, if you're suffering persecution because you're a murderer or because you're a thief, then that's obviously not a reason to happy, be happy or rejoice. That is not a glory for you um, to suffer in that case. And then he, he adds this list. Look at this list. Murderer, thief, Evildoer, these are all pretty bad things. This is like violating somebody else, right? Taking somebody's life, taking somebody's property, or doing evil, you know, injuring somebody, hurting somebody else, or a busybody in other men's matters. We have a tendency today to think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Really? Because God just listed it with murderers, thieves, and evildoers. There's four things in that list. Being a busybody is one of them. This is a big deal. This is something that we shouldn't just say, oh, it's not that big of a deal, you know, uh, it's, it's fine to gossip. No, it's not. It's, it, you need to mind your own business. People need to, these days, mind their own business. And it's so, it's so prevalent, especially with the internet and social media today. Everyone just wants to know what's good. Did you see what so-and-so put on their Facebook page? Can you believe that? And it's just this talking and gossiping back and forth. People just need to shut up and mind their own business. And look, these people that want to air all their dirty laundry on the internet, shame on you, but then shame on the other people who are, are all caught up in this and just want to talk about it with everybody else. Mind your own business. Proverbs 26, 17 says, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. It's another way of saying mind your own business. He's saying, look, it, you know, someone that passes by, and you're meddling with a fight that doesn't belong to you. Like when you start getting your, yourself involved, you know, there's a fight going on between two people, maybe two relatives, two friends. There's some fight where you decide, you know, I'm going to help out. I'm going to go and I'm going to give them my two cents and I'm going to mediate and I'm going to do all this other stuff. He's saying it's like taking a dog by the ears. And I don't know if you've ever done that before, but I don't suggest taking a dog by the ears. They don't like it. <laughs> and taking a dog by the ears is going to give you a very high tendency of getting bit. And this is what Proverbs is trying to explain to you, that don't get involved in other people's messes and other people's fights. And, I mean, we could take this to the level of even our country today. Why are we getting involved militarily in other people's arguments and other people's fights? I mean, there's been fighting going on in the Middle East since the beginning of time, yet America thinks that, well, we're going to straighten everybody out. We're going to, no, we're taking a dog by the ears and it's going to come back and bite us. And it already has multiple times. And it's going to continue to do so until Americans can learn this lesson. And it doesn't seem like Americans are getting better. It seems like we're getting worse because it's not just these national issues. It's personal issues. If you can't get the personal things taken care of, there's no way we're going to get the national stuff taken care of. It's this mindset. It's this attitude. We need to be able to just mind our own business. You should have enough work that you don't need to be worrying about what other people are doing with their time, with their kids, with their life. Worry about your own business. Romans chapter 1. Turn to Romans chapter 1 if you would. We're going to see some attributes of a reprobate. And I don't know about you, but... I don't want to be anywhere even closely associated with a reprobate. Now, not everybody who does some of these things means you're a reprobate, obviously. But what I'm saying is these are attributes that are associated with reprobates. We want to be as far away from this type of description as possible. Let's look at some of these, some of these things that are listed out in Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 28. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, and on and on. Verse number, the end of verse 29 says whisperers, and the beginning of verse 30 says backbiters. Excuse me. A backbiter is someone who is biting basically against at somebody's back with their words, right? So someone who is talking bad about someone behind their back. So when you go out and you're just, you're just speaking evil of somebody else, behind their back. It's like, I mean, it's like you're stabbing them in the back, right? You're a backbiter. And whispers, again, same thing. I mean, whispers, you're telling someone a secret. You don't want everyone to hear. You're doing this quietly. 
You're being a whisperer behind someone else's back and you're just spreading. It doesn't even matter. Maybe it's truth. Maybe it's lies. But um, they're things that ought not to be said. Uh, you don't have to turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Per, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 26. But in 2 Corinthians 12, 20, we basically see the same thing. It says, for I, fe for I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. All of these things in this list, it's, it's, it's not quite the same as the reprobates, but it's similar. It says, let's be debates. Think about debate. It's like fighting. Envyings is going to cause strife because you're wanting what someone else has. Wraths is hatred. Strife is fighting. Backbitings, whisperings, then swellings and tumults. Again, a lot of just fighting and a lot of strife is caught up in that, in, in that um, description here and all these attributes. Um, backbitings and whisperings is going to cause strife. It's just going to cause more fighting. Nothing good is ever going to come out of backbiting or out of whispering, spreading rumors, talking about other people behind your back. Nothing good will ever come of that. It is not something that edifies, not something that's good. And I strongly believe this. If you can't say something to a person's face, if you can't, if, if the words that you're going to say, if you're not able to say that right to the person that you're talking about, then it ought not to be said at all. If you're going to say something to someone else about another person, if you're not able to go right up to that person and tell them to their face, don't even bother saying it. It shouldn't be said. Because then you're just being a whisperer. And sometimes, even if you can't say it to their face, it doesn't mean that you should just go about saying it anyways. I'm not excusing that and saying that that's always okay. But dead sure, if you can't say something to somebody's face, don't say it at all. Proverbs 26, we're going to see a tale bearer. Someone who likes to tell stories. And again, a tale bearer, this could be true or not. It doesn't matter. Proverbs 26, look at verse number 20 of Proverbs 26. The Bible says, where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So that's, that's pretty simple for us to understand, right? You have a campfire or you run out of wood, well, guess what? The fire is going to go out too. If you don't have any wood, there's no way you can have a fire. It says, so where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. A tail bearer, someone who likes to go around and tell stories, to go around and tell stories about people, it causes fights. It causes strife. It causes arguments. It, causes, it pits people against each other. There's no one doing that. You say the, the, the fighting's going to stop. The strife ceaseth. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Verse 24, um, there's, there's a few words that we might not use very often today, but it says, He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. When you dissemble, I mean, think about like assemble. Well, dissemble is, a, is the opposite. You're taking something apart. He's saying he, he's, he's breaking people down. He's taking, you know, breaking relationships down between, between people. He's doing it with his lips. He's dissembling with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. He's a liar, a tale bearer, someone who likes to just lie about other people and just it's just causing hurt. And, and bringing people down and causing fights and causing relationships to be destroyed. And then it says the same person that does this, this is this person that hates, right? This is someone, obviously, if you're going about and you're destroying people, um, there's, no, there's no purpose for it except you, don't, except you hate them. I mean, if you're going about and you're going to talk about, so, you know, about, about a person or about a family member or about someone else, and you're saying this to somebody, let's just think of an example here. There's come up with something on the top of my head, right? So, um, <clears throat> if I were to go, I have two brothers. Okay, and this is not a true story. I'm just trying to make up something right now. I have two brothers. If I were to go to one of my brothers and say, you know, hey, you know, your other brother said, said this about, you know, about you, or can you believe he's doing that? What I'm doing is I'm trying to pit 
the one against the other. Right? I'm starting a fight. I'm starting a strife by going in and talking from one to the other. And it says, he that hateth dissembleth with his lips. I don't love my brothers for doing that and causing this strife and causing this fight. I hate them. If I were to do something like that, keep that in mind. And it says, Layeth up with Jesus. It says, When he speaketh fair, believe him not. So when he starts speaking good, um, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Basically, he's saying he's a liar and he's probably setting a trap. That's someone who um, flatters with their lips. You've got to watch out for that too. But let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Titus chapter number two. Flip over to Titus. Because here's the other thing you got to look out for. You know, maybe you're not the one necessarily starting things, but you hear someone else say something, and it's gossip, and it's rumors, and you have no way of verifying anything because you're just hearing something said by somebody else. You have to make sure that you don't become a tailbearer because if something you hear, you start repeating, you could be, very, you could be guilty of a very serious sin just by repeating something that you heard. You want to make dead sure that the words that you speak, the words that you come out of your mouth, hey, those words have been verified and that you're not just repeating something else that's been told that you don't know if it's true or not, that you heard about someone else because then you could become a false accuser. And that is a very serious sin. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse number 3. The Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. That's using discretion, right? Using discretion in the things that you say, not, not talking about things you ought not. You're discreet. You're keeping things to yourself. Um, chaste, pure, right? Keepers at home, not keepers in everybody else's home and going about and getting involved in everyone else's business. Be a keeper at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 12. I really need, you really got to see this because Revelation 12, you don't want to be a false accuser. When you start repeating things, you know, accusations that other people have made, and you dead sure don't want to be just making stuff up and accusing people whether you, if you don't know the truth about it or not. But since this is tied in more with gossiping and backbiting and, and this type of, of a conversation, you know, it's, you don't want to be repeating what someone else has said. If someone tells you something, maybe it's negative about someone, you don't, don't go repeating that unless you know for a fact. And even then, if you know it for a fact, um, you know, that would make you not, not a false accuser. But make sure it's, it's, it's not something you shouldn't be talking about, right? If you're going to repeat, repeat a matter. But look at who you are in company with if you're a false accuser, Ver Revelation 12, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil is a false accuser. Satan is the biggest accuser of the brethren. He goes to God and what he does, he accuses us. He accused Job to God. Job was a righteous man, yet the devil went and he's a liar and he accused uh, um, Job to God and said, oh yeah, if you do this, God, Job's going to curse you. Yeah, he doesn't have integrity, God. You know, you do this to him, watch what he does. The devil is an accuser. You don't want to be in league with the devil. You want to be in company with the devil. You want to make sure that the things that you say are true, that they're not lies, that you don't become a false accuser or even necessarily an accuser. Why would you want to accuse the brethren? That's what the devil does. There's no reason to be bringing other people down in the church and accusing them, especially accusing them falsely. We've all heard that saying, you know, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all. And that's a pretty good advice. Now, there are a few, ex there, there's a very limited exception to what I would say about, you know, with 
relating to being an accuser or saying something that would be negative about somebody else there is a time and a place for this but it's not very often and it's not something that should happen very often um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 if you want to turn there I've already preached a sermon about this but basically if a brother in Christ someone who is called a brother in the church is involved in a serious sin that needs to be outed that needs to be dealt with that needs to be handled by the church Yes, at that point, then, you know, it needs to be brought to light. But this is not every little thing. This is not, you know, I, I saw so-and-so go to the movies, you know, and we don't believe in going to the movies, you know, like whatever. There, there's things like that. Look, keep that to yourself. You don't need to be talking about other people like that. These, this would be a situation where it would be okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. So if someone is in church, that's brother so-and-so, right? We have, we have brother Sebastian in church. He's a faithful member. He goes out soul winning. You know, he's faithful to church. We know he's a brother, but then we find out, oh, you know, he's covetous. He's an idolater. He's a a railer or a drunkard, right? These are things, or an extortioner. says, will such a one know not to eat? For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. These are people that are worthy of judgment from within, from within the church. He says, but them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. This is a case where, hey, this needs to be brought to light. This is a sin where someone's going to need to be rebuke, rebuked and cast out of the church because they're an extortioner, because they're a drunkard, because they're a fornicator. This is, but, but this is not, it shouldn't be very common in church, right? Especially among someone who's called a brother. Now, a brand new believer, we're not talking about a brand new believer who's still, like they just got saved yesterday and they live with their girlfriend. Look, are they going to need to grow? Yes. Uh, is there going to come a point where they're going to need to, to decide, you know, are they going to keep coming to church or are they going to, you know, do what's right in God's eyes and stop being a fornicator? Yes, but it's not something that necessarily has to happen just overnight, right? It should, but, th you know, these are the types of people that we're dealing with. Um, just so you understand what we're talking about here, um, anything else, I mean, keep it to yourself. Okay, there's no reason to go talking bad about people. And maybe it's true. You say, oh, but I'm, it's, it's the truth. It's the truth, so why can't I say it? Well, if, if all you're doing is just tearing somebody else down because of some sin that they're in, what's the purpose? Why do you have to go and talk bad about that person to someone else? What is that going to do? What good, what, what good is that going to do to anybody involved by just talking about somebody else? Well, it's true. I don't care if it's true. It doesn't matter. You should keep your business to yourself and don't worry about what other people are doing. I mean, you can worry about them in the sense that, hey, if you want to try to help them, approach them. Talk to them about it. Show them in the Bible, hey, I think you're an error. I think you're doing this and you shouldn't be doing this. You know, don't go talking about it to somebody else. Bring it up to your brother or sister in Christ yourself. That is the proper motivation. That is something that you can do to help somebody. But going about and just telling someone else about what they're doing isn't going to help that person at all. It's not going to help anybody. Because now you're just going to start forming some, some bad thoughts in this other person's mind about that person. And, and they don't even know for sure if that's true. You're just, you're just telling it to them. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. See, the words that come out of our mouth are important. That's why we started off in James 3. They're extremely important. You can't take words back once you say them. Once those words come out of your mouth, they're gone. They're out there and they're going to do the damage that they're going to do. We need to make sure we have that filter on our mouth that we can think before we speak. Ephesians chapter number 4, starting in verse number 22, the Bible reads, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness wherefore putting away lying 
Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Again, speaking what's true and what's right is important. We shouldn't be lying, obviously. Um, let's continue reading here. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that, may, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This, these are the things that we need to be speaking. He says, no corrupt communication. Don't be lying. Don't be saying things you ought not to say. He says, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying is bringing somebody up. Edifying is building people up. It's not dissembling. It's not tearing them down. Edifying is when you build somebody up. This is the type of conversation that we need to have. If you're going to talk about someone else, hey, talk good things about that person. Do something that's going to build that person up, not that's going to just tear them down in the minds of others. It says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If we don't, you know, the, the words that we speak can be grieving to the Holy Spirit when we speak things we ought not to be speaking. Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And that's what it boils down to oftentimes is that people are bitter against someone else and that's when they start making these comments about them and that's when they start spreading rumors about people is because they're bitter against them. They have bitterness in their soul. Maybe someone did you wrong, you know, at some point in your life, but you're just bitter about it so you're just going to keep on bad-mouthing that person over what they did. So-and-so stole this from me or whatever. You know, I, get, I, lend, I lend, you know, my knife to this friend and they never gave it back to me. And then you just get bitter about that. So then every little thing they do, you're just talking bad about them to other people because they wronged you at some point. That's wicked. Don't let that root of bitterness spring up inside of you. And, you know, you have to be able to forgive and let those things go. He says, evil speaking, you know, put it away from you. This is, these are things that can destroy churches. These are things that happen now. Obviously, we're a real small church. We don't have a problem with this. But, um... You know, as the church grows, you know, people, especially get more and more people, people tend to get circles of friends, cliques where, you know, there's this group and that group and they start talking bad about each other. It could get to the point, churches split over this, over this sin, over these rumors, all this stuff just being, being, you know, thrown about and talked about and goes around the whole church and it gets people pitted against each other and hating each other. Hey, look, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. He is an accuser. He's going to definitely, dead sure he's going to want us to be accusers too. He's going to be looking at the members of the church trying to get them to make accusations against other people in the church because he wants us to be split. He doesn't want us to be in unity as a family and, and striving together with the same, the same goal in mind as we ought to be and being able to overlook people's transgressions and be able to, to look past people's shortcomings and not just talk bad about them to other people. Verse 32 says, And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the attitude we need to have. It's kindness. It's not kind to be talking bad about people behind their back. <clears throat> Think about the purpose of what you're saying when you say something to someone. You know, if it's... If it's um, If you, if you were to witness something that you don't like about someone, I don't like the way that they, they discipline their children. Right? This could be something that's common. You say, I, I think that they're too hard on their kids. I don't think they should be like that. I think, you know, whatever it is that rubs you the wrong way, what is that going to accomplish by then going and telling somebody else? What are you accomplishing? You see something and say, you know what, I don't like this. And okay, you can judge that in yourself, fine, you know, fine. But when you decide to say, you know what, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to tell this person. They're not involved with the situation at all, but now I'm just going to start telling them, you know, this person. I, I, don't, I don't like, you know, I saw them, I saw them, they, they had a, a ruler and they spanked their kid's butt and they barely even did anything wrong. And that's not, you know, 
What are you accomplishing? What, what are you gaining by, by speaking like that and by just talking bad about someone else? Are you, are you helping that family? Are, are you giving any type of advice or anything that you, you might be able to say, hey, I think this is wrong because biblically, you know, you shouldn't be like this and you're going to approach that person and tell them? No, when you're telling somebody else who's not even involved, you are accomplishing nothing but dissembling and trying to tear down someone else and try to taint somebody else's mind and try to get more people just against this person that you have some personal grievance with. For whatever reason, when especially about something like that, hey, mind your own business. That has nothing to do with you. That's their family. They're the parents. They're the ones that are going to decide the way that they raise their children. You don't need to worry about that. Worry about your own kids. Worry about your own family. Worry about your own work. Our conversations ought to be something that is becoming of Christians. Something that God can look at and be happy. And think, about. think about God. God's watching you have this conversation with another person. Do you think that pleases God to just hear you backbiting against somebody else? Getting involved in their matters and just speaking down about a brother in Christ? One of the best things you could do is put yourself in their shoes. The person you want to talk bad about, take a step back and just think for a minute. The thing that they did that I don't like that I'm going to go talk to this person about, what if the roles were reversed and they just started talking bad about me because I did this? Would that be right? Yeah, think about it from the other perspective. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We as a church, again, I just preached on this, on unity. We need to be of one spirit. One mind. We're striving together. We are working together for the goal, the common goal, the faith of the gospel. When we have bickering and gossiping and things going back and forth between the church, it's going to destroy that unity. It's wickedness. We can't have it. 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're almost done. 1 Peter chapter number 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14 says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's a, verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, as God is holy. Think about how holy God is. How holy and sanctified and perfect is God without sin. As he is holy, that's how holy you need to be in all manner of conversation, the Bible says. Everything that you speak, you need to be as holy as God. That's what, that's what it's commanding us in 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn, if you would, to chapter 3. Again, one more. this is one more place that's, that's a little bit more geared towards the ladies, as I believe ladies have a, little bit more of a, have a lot more of a tendency, actually, to, to, to get caught up in this. Um, Nothing against you ladies, it's just, it's just by nature, but we need to listen to this. And it's not just ladies, though. Men don't just think that, oh yeah, this is just a, the pro women have a problem. It's not. Women are more susceptible to this, but men could have this problem too. It's, it goes for both. Everybody needs to be paying attention to this. But 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1 says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. See, 
a lot of women who, who get caught up with the gossiping and the backbiting and, and, and these types of problems, being busybodies, getting involved in other people's business, they don't have the meek and quiet spirit. They tend to be loud and, and getting involved in other people's stuff and just speaking way more than they ought to. But the Bible says that a, a meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God, in God's eyes, a woman that has a meek and a quiet spirit is of great price. God holds a high value on a woman having the attributes of a meek and a quiet spirit. Again, it may not be easy to do, but you need to try to strive to get to this point, to, to, to get yourself to understand this is what God values. Do I care about, about how God views me? If I do, I want to be of great price in his eyes. I want to be valuable in his eyes. How am I going to do that? Oh, well, the Bible says if I have a meek and a quiet spirit, then and he holds that in high regard. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to try to, to, to make whatever changes in my life inside to just to focus on, you know what, I need, to, I need to just try to be meek. I need to be quiet. This is what the Bible says. It says, For after the manner, this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. This, this whole section is not as much geared towards the, the point of this sermon. This is more just about women you know, being submissive and being in subjection to their husbands. But the meek and quiet spirit is going to help you with, this, with the problems of gossiping and getting involved in matters that don't belong to you. My last point, I'm going to close with this. Turn to Proverbs 25, 23. I want you to see this in Proverbs 25. This gives us advice on how do we deal with this. You, say, you know what? I, I generally, I don't talk bad about people, right? I, 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 don't, I don't spread rumors. I try not to gossip. You know, I don't get involved in this stuff. But sometimes it comes to me. Sometimes people try to gossip to me and I don't know how to handle it. So I just smile and I just, you know, nod or, or say, oh, wow, really? That's the wrong way to deal with it. I'm going to show you. The Bible explains what, how we need to deal with this. Because we are, look, it's a serious sin. This is not something, this is something that people need to be ashamed of. If they're a busybody, it's something that says, look, don't even company with that person. They're getting involved in other people's business. This is how we deal with a person that comes to you and decides to just start gossiping and backbiting against somebody else. When you hear this happen, this is how we deal with it. Look at Proverbs 25, 23. The Bible says, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. Angry, that means your face. The way that you look at someone, you give somebody a dirty look. When someone tries to come at you and is backbiting against someone else, the Bible says you know how you drive that away? You know how you get rid of that? You just give them a real nasty look. You're going to come at me backbiting against someone else? Don't show agreement with them. Don't show pleasure. Don't be like, oh, I want to hear. What's all, the, what's all the dirty news I can hear about someone else? You give them a dirty look, and the Bible says that that'll drive that away. That should make them ashamed. When you just, just give them that dirty look, and you could even go further than that and be like, oh, really? Well, why don't we just go get so-and-so involved, whoever you're talking about, and let's have a discussion about this. Because I guarantee you, if you say something like that, they're going to run away scared. They don't want to tell that person to their face. They want to backbite against them. One of the best things we could do is just get this stuff straightened out. You got a problem with someone else. Hey, you go deal with somebody else. You don't need to be talking to... to everybody else about this person's problems. They go backbiting. We deal with that by giving dirty looks. And I hope that nobody in this room will ever get involved with this gossiping, busybody type of mentality. It's pervasive. It, 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 could, it could try to suck you in. It's easy to, to want to get involved in this. Oh, this juicy gossip. Don't get deceived. Don't get brought into this. It's wickedness. It doesn't help anybody. We need to be edifying the brethren. We don't need to be spreading rumors about people or talking bad about people, except in those very few cases that we already mentioned that need to be dealt with within the church. When you have an issue like that, yes, 
But otherwise, look, you're a sinner too. Do you want someone else going around and pointing out every single one of your faults to everybody else around you and just start talking bad about you? I don't think you would because I know I wouldn't want that. I'm not perfect. I have my own sins too. And nobody needs or wants everybody else going around and talking behind your back about all the things, the little things that you do that are wrong. Amen. Keep it to yourself. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please just help us to watch what we say. God, the, the tongue truly is an unruly evil, dear Lord. Um, help us to, to be able to apply a filter to our mouths that we would think about the things that we say. Lord, help these truths to sink down into our hearts and into our minds that we wouldn't even think about, about participating in this nonsense, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to have the, the boldness and the guts to at least be able to give a dirty face to people when they try to, to backbite against others, that we wouldn't be participating in their wickedness, dear God. Lord, I pray that you please bless this church. I know this isn't a problem here right now, and Lord, I pray that it would never be. I pray that you please help us to grow as a family, help us to grow together as brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord, and um, for the common cause of, of preaching the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.